Uh, thank you all very much. As Dr. Mark said, Crystal's not here, so unfortunately you are stuck with me. Um, public speaking isn't a strong point, so please bear with me. Um, and I'd just like to take uh, the, a moment to say thank you very much, Dr. Mark, for this opportunity. It's much appreciated. Um, so today I'll provide you with an overview of the Dangerous Prisoners Sexual Offenders Act legislation in Queensland. Uh, in addition to covering the referral process that um, sort of governs that, DPSOA case management in the community and the contravention of these supervision orders and so essentially how we respond when someone breaches their order. Um, the goals of the High Risk Offender Management Unit, which I'll now refer to as HIROMU, um, is to improve community safety and in turn break the cycle of reoffending. Our unit aims to deliver efficient and effective community-based supervision, which targets criminogenic risk and responsivity factors. HIROMU performs a specialist function and targets the, sorry, and targets the highest risk sexual offenders. So the High Risk Offender Management Unit is made up of a few distinct components. So it, we have our director, Jenny Linus, strategic risk and support. We have our office here in Townsville and Rockhampton, which is Hiromu Central to Far North and Queensland, and also um, Hiromu in South East Queensland. We also have an electronic monitoring and surveillance unit and clinical support unit. So strategic risk and support is responsible for key agency functions associated um, with DIPSO legislation. So they're responsible for organising and participating in the Sex Offender and Dangerous Offender Assessment Committee, SODAWAC, uh, liaising with Crown Law and the Supreme Court, providing clinical support to officers who are supervising sex offenders across the state, assisting in the case management of DIPSO offenders, and oversighting the management of offenders subject to continuing detention orders. Our electronic monitoring and surveillance unit is responsible for the GPS monitoring of offenders across the state. Uh, this unit operates 24 hours per day uh, and coordinates our agency response in the event that a significant incident occurs. Um, they also contribute to the surveillance and case management of not only DIPSO offenders, but also up to 500 parolees across, across Queensland. Hiromu in South East Queensland provides specialist case management of DPSOA offenders within South East Queensland. Uh, this unit manages approximately 70% of the offenders who are supervised under these orders, and the team operates out of the Dara District Office though the staff there provide mobile case management across a range of probation and parole district offices within that region. Um, Hiromu Central to Far North Queensland, so that's us. Um, we try to provide specialist case management to DPSOA offenders located in our region. We operate out of Townsville and Rockhampton. The unit was established in November in 2006 and centralised the management of DIPSO offenders within the catchment area who were previously supervised by um, probation and parole officers across the region. Um, at present, our unit's comprised of three senior case managers in Townsville, one in Rockhampton, uh, myself, our manager Crystal Taylor, as well as our surveillance and admin team. So where did it all start? By the end of the 20th century, it was concluded that some offenders could not be treated and therefore could not safely be released into community. Laws to detain and control sex offenders after their sentences have ended have now been passed in most states of Australia. Offenders who've completed their sentences for serious sexual offences, including offences against children, can be detained in prison beyond their full-time discharge date on the grounds that they're considered to be at risk of committing further sex offences. So the DPSOA commenced in 2003 and it was the first legislation of its type within Australia. It was introduced in response to the need to protect the community against high-risk sexual offenders who remained an unacceptable risk of reoffending upon release from prison. The DPSOA was challenged in the High Court. In Farden v Attorney General, the High Court upheld the constitutional validity of the Act and held that it is non-punitive legislation. So at present, um, this is our number of current orders. So since 2003, there have been 239 supervision orders made in the Supreme Court. At present, there's 182, and that's made up of 131 that are supervised, 125 of those being subject to electronic monitoring. So we supervise, as of the 19th of October, 29 here locally in Townsville and in Rockhampton, 
and 102 are supervised by the South East Queensland Office. We have 26 that are subject to continuing detention orders and 25 subject to interim continuing detention orders. So DPSOA legislation is applied if the court satisfied that the offender is a serious danger to the community in the absence of one of these orders and that there's an unacceptable risk that the prisoner will commit a serious sexual offence if they're released from custody or if they're released from custody without a supervision order being made. So a serious sexual offence would include a sexual offence against a child or sexual offending involving violence against an adult. The focus of the law is to provide possible safeguards to the community at the completion of an offender's sentence. It's targeted towards protecting the community against serious sexual offenders who continue to represent an unacceptable risk. The legislation falls within civil law, so it's unlike offending, uh, sorry, it's unlike offending dealt with in criminal courts. As such, different standards of proof apply. Um, it's based on the balance of probabilities as opposed to the test of beyond reasonable doubt. Proving something beyond reasonable doubt is a lot harder, so it's essentially a lower burden of proof um, to, given that no one can predict with 100% certainty um, whether someone will or won't offend again in the future. So this approach is aligned with the business of dealing with risk, the imperfect science of predicting something that hasn't yet occurred. Whilst I'll explain further about the referral and application process, the idea is that there is a body of information that suggests there's an unacceptable likelihood the offender would re-offend without one of these supervision orders being made. So as you can see, this is the referral process. Um, when the Attorney General decides to proceed um, with an application, um, they commence pre-release planning and a preliminary hearing is held. So the court must be satisfied beyond reasonable grounds for believing the offender is a serious danger to the community um, in the absence of an order. After that, a final hearing date is set and two psychiatrists are appointed to meet with that offender um, to provide risk assessments to the court. After this, the final hearing date is set, usually for one or two months before the offender's discharge date. So there's two general outcomes generated from a successful application for a DIPSO order. So that's either a supervision order or a continuing detention order. So a continuing detention order would mean that the offender's detained in custody following their full-time discharge date and that they're reviewed every 12 months. The other option would be a supervision order, which would involve strict conditions of community release tailored to minimise that offender's risk. Um, and that's facilitated through structured case management um, by the High Risk Offender Management Unit. So, a typical supervision order um, will include standard conditions and it will include additional conditions. So standard conditions would just be how often someone has to report to us, their employment, accommodation, as well as those electronic monitoring and curfew requirements. Additional conditions on an order would vary based on their offending profile um, and it could include things around substance testing but also around having no contact with children, um, if it's deemed necessary, um, limits on them accessing pornography, accessing the internet um, and taking prescribed medication as directed. So case management within Hiromu is made up of a number of elements. Our senior case managers conduct reporting informed by risk assessment frameworks and use specialised sex offender assessment tools such as the acute, stable and static. Written directions may be issued and curfew stages are discussed. Case management meetings are also conducted via home visit as that's another way to inform and assess risk and also involves the coordination of services to ensure that reintegration and rehabilitation needs are also met. Referrals to treatment providers. Um, the unit works closely with a number of local treatment providers and support services uh, to assist reintegration and rehabilitation. QCS also delivers targeted sex offender treatment programs both in the community and in prison. Many of those subject to DPSOA supervision orders um, are required to attend these QCS sex offender treatment programs. Um, and those programs are basically based on the cognitive behavioural therapy model that target the cognitive drivers based behind um, sexual offending, um, whilst also providing offenders with the cognitive, emotional and behavioural skills to live an offence-free lifestyle. So, um, 
our unit supervises offenders who have connections to rural and remote communities across the state and our unit collaborates with community elders, justice groups and families to try and assist offenders to reconnect with their culture wherever possible. Um, for example, um, we recently had um, a person subject to a supervision order who um, we found out his mother was about to die in Cairns. Um, given you can probably appreciate how restrictive these orders are, that officer, after finding that out, went around um, collaborating with the public guardian, the public trustee, this person's support workers, management. So within an afternoon to organise his flights to Cairns, um, she went with him and organised another officer to go with her so that he could have that final time with his family. Um, so wherever possible, our unit does try to ensure that we get the best possible outcomes in terms of community safety, but also maintaining, wherever possible, a therapeutic and community and culturally based approach. Um, if a person subject to one of these orders does not comply, uh, there is a contravention process. So that would vary, I guess, based on how serious the contravention is. So there's a few options, one of which is a verbal warning, which would be for a minimal contravention. Um, a written warning, which we refer to as a notice of contravention. Uh, we can refer the matter to Queensland Police Service for a contravention of relevant order charge. Um, or if it is a serious breach or we have serious concerns that someone poses a risk to the community, um, a Section 20 warrant can be issued. Um, and then their matter would be heard before the Supreme Court, who would decide um, whether or not they're safe to be re-released or whether they remain in custody um, pending further review. If um, an offender were to remove their GPS device, they'd face up to a minimum of 12 months in custody, um, but up to five years. So if someone was issued a continuing detention order, as I said earlier, they're reviewed every 12 months and that involves new psychiatric reports being prepared. Um, and that information is also um, including uh, case notes, reports, reintegration, planning updates, all of which are uh, provided to the Supreme Court. The court can then decide to continue that detention order, order community supervision, or grant no order. That's all. I'm very sorry if I spoke too fast. Oh, thank you. So much. <laughs> thank you.